Hello and welcome to the course Society Language Difference. Um, this is the first of an 11, of an 11 week journey uh, into post-war French philosophy. Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. So my name is Dan Taylor. Um, hi, uh, I guess ordinarily we would be meeting in a classroom and talking and debating philosophy and politics, um, but for obvious reasons, that's not gonna happen. Um, so the classes are taking place remotely. Um, I will send you around a link for the lecture, which should normally be about one hour. And then we're going to meet and talk on Mondays through Zoom. Um, so in the meantime, it's remote. And right, let's start getting into it. So um, in our first week, we are going to talk about the three H's. Now you might be starting to wonder who the three H's might be, and I'm not going to tell you just yet. You're going to, I'm going to let you kind of wonder this. What I want to do in this lecture is um, just set out um, the historical trajectory of what this course, is, well, what, course what, what direction is going to take. Um, we're going to think about the world in which some key thinkers emerge. Uh, I'm, we're going to talk a bit about whether these guys are um, peddlers of obscure untruths. We're going to talk about the reputations of different post-war French philosophers. And then what I'm going to do in the second part, and so this first lecture is going to probably be a little bit longer than subsequent ones, is I want to give you a little bit more of a philosophical grounding in what was happening in French for um, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. And this is going to involve our three H's. So this maybe this is getting you slightly closer to working out what they might be. Now, I want to start with an image. Now, in front of you, you can see some some men, some young men um, throwing stuff, throwing sticks and stones. Now, you are probably guessing rightly um, that this this is an image of rioting and protest. Because our course is post Second World War French philosophy, and judging by the clothing of these men, the 1960s, this is an image from May 1968. A huge wave of riots and protests that swept mainly through Paris uh, in France with remarkable consequences. 10 to 11 million workers out on strike. Paris in many places becoming ungovernable. And a series of disturbances that um, initially begin um, because students um, react when local authorities try to prevent them from getting rid of the gendered dormitories in one of the Paris colleges. Basically, the dormitories are split, male, female, and some of the students think this is too old fashioned. There's an occupation. There's quite a crude eviction of this occupation. And then it escalates, and then it escalates, and then it escalates. Here's another image, this is from the Sorbonne. Now I want to begin with these images because um, it brings to mind a quote that you might have heard recently in relation to coronavirus um, from Lenin. Uh, that there are decades where weeks happen and there are weeks where decades happen. And it's interesting to think of an event like May 1968 in France in which workers, in which students nearly topple not just the political regime of Charles de Gaulle, but also an entire culture, and maybe even also an entire way of living or a way of seeing, one based around boring Fordist production lines about um, repressed bourgeois family households, about old fashioned morality, about the declining influence of the Christian Church, of Catholicism in France, of a new world wishing and struggling to be born. Now we associate this very much with the 1960s, as if there was you know, something intoxicating uh, in the air, as if the water was, was spiked in some way, that there was something about these climactic years. And when we can see this when we look at what's happening in the United States with the civil rights movement and various protests, West Germany, Czech Republic, Mexico, Britain, all over the place. An old order seems to be shaking. 
Old ideas about work and the family were shaking. Old beliefs in technological and social progress were weakening. Now there's a tendency to look at these events and think that they relate just to the 1960s. And certainly what we're dealing with, and we see this in this image, are a young generation or a new generation. But what I'd like us to think about first in this kind of historical outline is one in which these young people and with workers as well, not so young people were struggling against. And for that, we need to think about what was happening in France, and what had happened in France, what would make France in particular such a fertile place for these um, exciting and groundbreaking new currents in philosophy and thinking. Now, France, unlike Britain, um, had been occupied during the Second World War and not just occupied. As you may know, um, the occupation in its first few years involves a great degree of collaboration. A World War I military hero, Pétain, um, collaborates in, in effect with the invading Nazis and there is a independent, quasi-independent uh, state, French state, the Vichy Free State based in Vichy. Now, for the young people throwing stones or whatever they can get their hands on at riot police, there is a broader question here about fascism and about the repetition of fascism and about the problem of collaborating with fascism or the problem of not doing enough to resist fascism and of asking where did this fascism come from? Was it some kind of unique German or Italian condition? No, of course it wasn't. Was it something that was imposed um, by a very small group of people on a, a wide-ranging society? Well, to a degree, yes, but that imposition involved a great degree of complicity, if not consent, by large numbers of the, of the people. Why did people desire fascism in cases? Why did they not resist? How is it that some of the most horrific crimes of human history could be committed by some of the most culturally, technologically sophisticated peoples to have ever existed. Now this is something that we must keep in mind when we think not just about something like May 1968, but in the decades that had preceded it. As intellectuals across Europe struggled to work out, could there be any meaning after this? Could the old meanings in technological pro progress or a sense of universal goodness and universal morality still be possible? Could we cling to those dreams when we've seen how those dreams could be dashed before? How even the most innocent could be murdered? Where did philosophy go after this? This is a question that we'll be thinking about in the first couple of weeks of this course. As Theodore Adorno, an important member of the Frankfurt School, put, there could be no lyric poetry after Auschwitz. He says elsewhere that the aims of the Enlightenment became stuck in the mud of Auschwitz. That's something about um, the dream of Enlightenment, the dream that human beings and the human mind could become the centre of the universe that human beings could acquire comprehensive knowledge of nature and the things and could use that knowledge to subjugate nature to its needs in a way that would empower one and all. How did this form of enlightenment that across the 19th and into the early 20th century led to so many breakthroughs in the sciences, in mathematics, in physics, how had it led to something like this? Of course, you may be thinking at this point, maybe there isn't such a connection, but the work of people like Adorno, Horkheimer, we'll look at Walter Benjamin next week, even Hannah Arendt, an important thinker, but not one that we'll consider in much depth on this course. All of their work was, was trying to historicise how these unbelievable atrocities had occurred. 
Now this image is from the liberation of Paris in 45. And these are all French soldiers. Now there's a very exciting moment at the end of the Second World War in which French intellectuals who had either been in hiding, had been in exile, or had served in resistance movements in some way, began to think and debate about what a new world would be like after the Second World War, after the death camps. An important thinker in this tradition is Albert Camus. Now Camus, uh, you probably will be familiar with some of his works already, the myth of Sisyphus. He is often called an existentialist thinker. Existentialist because the his subject, his concern, is with human experience and human subjectivity, what it means to be human. This he considers to be the primary concern of literature. Of course, he you know, writes a lot of literary works and philosophy as well. Now, Camus is a resistance newspaper editor during the Second World War. So he has a kind of role in the resistance. And as a result, he sees and certainly hears about a lot of shocking and horrific things. And there is a really stirring lecture that he gives in 1946 to an American audience at Columbia University, which is called The Human Crisis. And I want to just give you a little bit of this because it will help us think about the kind of world in which philosophers over the 50s, 60s, 70s in France were trying to move away from and the kind of world that they wished to move towards. That's not to say they all were looking to go in the same direction, but there was certainly a common drive to escape from something. So Camus says, Today in France and in Europe there is a generation who thinks that anyone who places his hope in the human condition is mad, but that anyone who despairs of events is a coward. This generation refuses absolute explanations and the rule of political philosophies, but wishes to affirm men and women in their flesh and in their striving for liberty. This generation does not believe the achievement of universal happiness and satisfaction is possible, but it does believe in diminishing human sorrow. It is because the world in its essence unhappy is unhappy that we need to create some joy because the world is unjust we need to work towards justice and because the world is absurd we must provide it with all its meaning now if you've read the myth of sisyphus i mean i highly recommend this short work to you if you've read it you'll know that one of the key arguments that camus makes there is that when human beings look around at the universe, what they are confronted with is not a human-like God who cares about them and wishes the best for them, but a cold, silent, unlistening universe, a universe that doesn't care, a universe that has no regard for human happiness or well-being in any form, a universe in which there isn't universal meanings. Those meanings, we maybe once believed in them, but now they were lost. Instead, what we're faced with is this kind of colossal absurdity. When we look at the absurdity and the meaninglessness of life, this is going to make us very bloody depressed. And that's a big part of what Camus is trying to say. We should be depressed. We, we should even be suicidal. But because we can't live with that despair, because we can't live with that uncertainty, we need to create meaning. And that lands on all our desks, as it were. That lands on all of us. We all need and must create meaning. The question is, how do we take responsibility for making that meaning and for recognising the freedom to make that meaning that we do have? Or do we duck that responsibility and just run away to the old ideals and the old beliefs, become born again to something or others? Camus says, no, we need to do that hard work. Now, Camus described this generation, he's talking about as the interesting generation. Because they'd seen <clears throat> or been involved in so much that was uh, traumatic or epoch changing in the 40s, but actually these changes have been going on for a long time. We can look back to the French experience of World War I. We could think back to the, the economic crash of the late 20s and the immense political instability 
in the 30s and 40s. The slow encroachment of fascism, this sense of suffocation that the air was going out the room, that people felt more powerless. What happens next? Just as moments among the French resistance, the Maquis were inspiring and exciting and pointed to the possibilities of new forms of collective action. Others could be deeply tragic too, as people lost loved ones or had brushes with death in different ways. We get this in even in the um, French writers, like a, like a literary theorist, I suppose, Maurice Blanchot. He writes about his near experience with death, lived or imagined it, it's blurred. Now, when we think about this interesting generation and we think about France and his experience being occupied by the Nazis, where there was a, a great degree of collaboration, we also need to think about another question which haunted intellectuals, especially into the 1960s, 50s and 60s. Which is that how could so many people, how could how could the masses desire fascism, as Deleuze and Guattari will ask, and this is a, in a text that we will look at later in this course, how could all the people that we can see in this image, it just seems like thousands upon thousands, have swooned for Hitler? How could they have placed all of their hopes and their dreams in somebody who took away their individuality? who sucked them up into a mass movement, a universal movement, who took away their freedom. Well, maybe the things that I'm saying point to exactly what made Hitler compelling and what made, therefore, freedom so important for the existentialists like Camus or like Sartre. We'll talk about him a bit later as well. Because these individuals in this scene are doing exactly what Camus is trying to go against. They are not facing up to their, their inherent freedom and their inherent responsibility to construct meanings for themselves. Instead, they're giving up that freedom and they're allowing themselves to be, to, become, to liquefy, to become movements of people, to believe in a Fuhrer who directs them, to believe in a, almost like a Rousseauian general will. All of this is scary because it hides away from a truth that weighs upon all of us. That we need to think and understand this world for ourselves. We cannot give up this freedom. If we do give up that freedom, we give up something which is fundamentally human. So it is a concern in the 40s, 50s, 60s about the, we call it the psychological conditions and roots for fascism. What um, these controversial psychoanalysts that Wilhelm Reich will call the mass psychology of fascism. This is something that we'll also look at next week. Um, but of course, it doesn't just apply to Nazism. And this is something that also weighed on French intellectuals, especially after an event in 1957. I'll give you, this is like a real content bath, this, this first lecture. Oh, so you mainly if you want to pause at any point, like right, okay, I need to look this up. Um, I'll just, I'll just, I'm just kind of, I suppose, trying to set a scene of what's happening. Um, many French intellectuals on the left became quite demoralised with Soviet communism, especially after an event in Hungary in 1957, in which there was this kind of popular uprising. There were calls for great for what there were. Workers began organising in democratic councils, basically like what the Soviets were meant to be. And this seemed like a flashpoint, a moment where socialism could demonstrate its democratic credentials, its ability to kind of internally regenerate. And instead, Soviet tanks, Russian tanks roll into Budapest and the uprising in Hungary is very brutally crushed. This moment, 1957, is a watershed in France as well as in the UK. Because many intellectuals decide that maybe the Soviet Union, and especially what has then started to become revealed about Stalin and his purges, maybe the Soviet Union isn't the true face of communism. Maybe Marxists need to think about a new left. The new left is what emerges. But what is it about these mass movements? What is it about totalitarianism? How could that sweep up such culturally and technologically advanced societies in the 20s and 30s? And what is to stop it happening again? Now, less related to Hungary, but coming closer to the shores of the UK, 
is the experience of imperialism, of having an empire and losing an empire. Now, this is a bit of graffiti from Paris. This is, here is where we drown Algerians. Now, if you're wondering what this means, it refers to a very dark episode in French history. Uh, well, when we think of France, like the UK, after the Second World War, had an empire that spanned many parts of the globe. It's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you can see from here. Um, but, you know, largely, you know, like the UK, largely kind of bankrupt and defeated, you know, kind of defeated really after the Second World War. It's not, it really is not in a position to control its former colonies or former regions, former, you know, states. One of them is Algeria, which demands independence um, from France from the 50s and into the 60s. And this becomes a very, very violent and brutal war. We'll talk about this in our third week. Uh, through the writer Franz Fanon. There were protests in Paris, and the police basically forced many of these protesters, Algerian protesters, into the river, saying, where many drowned. We don't know how many, because there has been a cover-up, basically. So there are these painful experiences of losing an empire and what that means. And we know that losing an empire, losing in imperial regions, it, it differs in different ways. What makes the UK very interesting is that it, it in many cases, it granted um, independence to its former colonies without much of a fight. But other European states were held on more brutally. France, enough place, Indochina, Vietnam. This will become the Vietnam War. Now, this, I mean, this is a British image, 1886, Britannia. You know, you can imagine this in Michael Gove's office, I suspect. Um, Britannia being at the centre of the world of the Freedom and Fraternity Federation. Now, I'm not going to start waffling on about British history, but this simply points to a self-image that countries like, and people in these countries, British people, French people had. That they were the representatives and they were the highest form of civilization in Europe, in the world at this time. And not only that, they had a kind of paternal role. They were going to you know, father or mother all of the primitive civilizations around the world. We see that in this image here with the kind of semi-naked, dark-skinned figures. Now, this was traumatic when suddenly you are not, you cannot be, the masters of the universe in this way. Suddenly, these ideas of racial and cultural supremacy need to be unpicked. But they don't go, they don't disappear without a fight. And what we see in all the Western countries, when empires are lost, we thought this is one of the ingredients for the rise of Nazism, is the organisation of the far right as well in response. Now, let's go back to this image of the French soldiers liberating Paris. Now, I want you to have a look at their faces. Now, in case you're thinking, is there a famous person here? There might be. I don't really know, to be honest. But this, this is just a broader point. Now, if you look at their faces, among other things, you'll notice, well, they're all male, but um, you'll notice that they're all white. And certainly the image and the projected image that the French, well, all the powers did, but the French wished to give after the war, is that they, they had kind of liberated their own capital city um, as Frenchmen. And that Frenchness connoted whiteness. Now, I'm not being too airy fairy here in case you're worrying about this. Um, France, like the British, had a huge number of colonial regiments in the millions fighting in its forces. But these soldiers were told that they could not take part in the liberation of Paris. It was a, a, it was a, this was a PR moment. Only white battalions could be seen to march in. Now, one of the soldiers who happens to have black skin and who writes a lot about what that means is Franz Fanon, born in Martinique in the Caribbean, fights in the French forces, is excluded uh, from liberating Paris, is subject to a lot of racism, and this image on the right, you know, <laughs> A picture can say a thousand words. He then goes to Algeria and becomes a, a psychiatrist. 
And here's a very interesting eyewitness effects of colonialism. This is something that we'll talk about. Upheavals we're seeing already. Now, when we think, if you think back to the image at the beginning of those young men throwing uh, stuff, you know, at something on the right, right please, basically. That's also an image that in its own way says something about masculinity. And I think there's a lot that we can say about masculinity on this course. But one of the interesting flashpoints and moments around May 68 is the role of women, of young women, the participation of young women in these protests and the and the rise of a new form of feminism. A feminism that wasn't just attuned to winning the right to vote, which you might call first wave feminism of the early 20th century. But this is, is a broader feminism about um, about personal rights, about sexual rights, about access to abortion, to divorce, to contraception. Challenges that were coming with the women's liberation movement and with the gay liberation movement. Young women who are looking and desiring and demanding a completely different life from their mothers. This is another key context. Forces pushing in different directions. A sense too of wanting to move away from a way of life and a world of work that we could look back to the Fordist conveyor belt of the early 20th century. That was could often be very bureaucratic very regimented, very disciplined, very boring. I wanting something that would be different from that, different from a modernity in which the individual was suffocated and became just a mere cog in a machine. These youth movements, which are powered by decades of philosophical thinking that we're going to look at, are wanting something different. To face up to our freedom, to see our freedom as being perhaps the most important philosophical concern we should have. And that our freedom is something that's achieved, I guess, in, in our minds, through our understanding of our own selfhood, which therefore means that we don't wish to be swallowed up, as people were before, into mass movements, into bureaucracies, into grey, stifled masses. Instead, and this has a bearing when we think about fashion, we think about popular music, we think about rock music, we think about festivals, we think about clothing, hippie into punk, a new form of kind of radical individualism, completely at odds with this that you see before you. Not work like this. <laughs> this is a very, um, you know, I don't know, prophetic image. This is from. Orson Welles' is, um, rendition of Franz Kafka's The Trial, the open plan office, which I'm sure a few of you have worked in. Wanting an escape from this. This is also an image from The Trial, Orson Welles' The Trial. If the individual wanting to escape, flee from a world like this, a world that is boring, a world that is restricted, a world in which other structures and other institutions do the thinking for you, no. There is a huge emphasis in what we're going to look at on thinking for yourself, of desiring and demanding a world for yourself. And that, I guess, therefore means, and this has a big bearing on, on leftist protest, of left-wing political movements, of which many of our thinkers were part of, of finding like-minded offers to protest and desire and to raise your own consciousness with. The final thing that we should just keep in mind here, before I tell you about what well, we'll get into the course, in a moment, um, is youth culture. This is a still from Jean-Luc Godard's film, Breathless. Um, of the rise of new wave cinema, of different forms of fashion, of clothing, of hairstyles, different forms of dress. Now, I'm not gonna start going to all of these, but um, you know, use, use your imagination. You can kind of, you can probably think of different items of clothing, makeup, and maybe the broader things like contraception and how sex was changing, how sex could change, and what that meant. If you had access to contraception, that didn't mean that you necessarily had to, you know, have your first child at the age of 19 or 20. It didn't mean that you had to get married at a very young age. It meant that suddenly more options were available to you, and that was very powerful. Of course, you might want to be critical of this idea too. 
was this liberation for everybody? Or has, as some feminists have challenged, was this in many ways liberation for men because they could expect their female partners to use contraception? But often it took a lot more to change what it meant to be a woman in these times. It wasn't just about this thing or that, it was about one's relationship to one's mother. It was about the work opportunities available to women. And that is largely why the, the major work and the major developments of feminism are gonna take place in the 1970s, not the 1960s. And partly in response to some of the kind of shortcomings or inadequacies of this supposed liberation that had occurred in the mid to late 60s. Oh, okay, so there's a lot going off. Let's just briefly go through, let's just recap these contexts. And then we're going to think a bit about what makes our thinkers so either really annoying <laughs> or really interesting. Okay, so first thing I talked about um, was a loss of faith and visions of progress. August Comte, not the cheese, Comte of August Comte, he's associated with this 19th century um, thing called positivism. And it's this idea that you can strive for the same certainty in the social sciences you know like history or sociology that you get in the physical sciences that you can look at laws of you know laws of society like you would laws of nature now there are these beliefs in the 19th century that we can you know the human mind can gain universal knowledge and that we are progressing in a more liberal and a more in a better social direction but the first and the second world war and the death camps had obliterated that hope for many we've talked about the world wars occupation of France by the Nazis and also by, it's a kind of, I don't know, not Vichy, Vichy is a kind of occupation. We talked about colonialism just briefly, these are things that we're all going to go back to, Hungary 1957 and disaffection with the Soviet Union. We talked about youth culture, we might want to think here, anxieties about French identity being subsumed by American identity in the English language, a real kind of contempt for Disney, for ancient that there is, Euro Disney, maybe we'll probably talk about this in the final weeks. And then a broader thing here, this one is a bit more a bit more woolly, the socially grounded nature of human freedom. What do I mean by that? Well we're talking about human freedom, human freedom already as something that is um something that we need to kind of face up to and, and recognise as our own power and capacity to um to develop the values and goals that we wish to live and think by. That this is work that we need to do and not offers. If we give up our, our freedom, our individuality, we're going to be guilty of what Sartre will call bad faith. We're going to pretend that we aren't free, but we are free. It's just that freedom is very difficult to face up to. But, and this is something that you get more in Camus' work, this freedom isn't just egocentric, it's not self centered, it's not, you know, it's not just about us. It's a freedom that we can understand and explore and develop through. Our relationships with others, through empowering ourselves with others, through demanding greater rights, through demanding greater spaces to think, through demanding greater equality in our in relationships with others, and understanding that even our own sense of selfhood is very much grounded on the way that we believe we are perceived and understood by others in the world. That last bit is a bit dense. I'm going to come back to it. Um, it's important. It will come up a bit later. Um, Okay, right, so this is the end of this kind of first section, I suppose. Um, if you want to have a quick cup of tea or something, you know, <laughs> feel free. Um, okay, right, so what we're now going to do is I just want us to kind of think a little bit about the rep the goal of philosophy, which is really broad, I know, but we're going to use this to think about what some of our thinkers in this course are trying to do and what they're accused of doing, because some of our thinkers have got a very bad reputation maybe justified let's talk about that okay um <clears throat> oh yeah i've missed out <laughs> entirely um the course of course it's called society language difference um uh without kind of i'll just briefly on this we use these three terms because we're interested in how philosophers largely french in the 1950s 60s and 70s become increasingly aware and increasingly argue that our social relations and politics are very important to our, our sense of who we are. We don't just need to look in our own minds as a kind of black box. We have to look at society and how that society is internalised in our minds. 
and how we believe we are understood in that society. Language, we haven't said much about language yet. There is a big interest in linguistics in this time. And there is the idea that you could understand the unconscious mind. And Freud is important in this period. Um, you could understand the unconscious mind. You could understand culture. You could understand society. In terms of structures of language that are universal. This is going to lead to semiotics. This is going to lead to structuralism. You start to think, shit, what do they mean? Don't worry, I'm going to cover this a bit later as well. And, largely, and then finally, difference. There is going to be an increasing emphasis in the middle and end part of this course that we shouldn't think about what is universal. We shouldn't try and reduce everything to the same because when we do that, we exclude minorities. When we do that, we stifle dissenting voices. Rather than aim for universality, we should aim for particularity. We should aim, for, we should aim to highlight what is different. And the great power of difference of, and of differing for subjectivity, for being different, for making a stand. How can you how can you discover and be who you are if that isn't in some sense being different from the norms in which you're brought up with in what Simone de Beauvoir would call the grown up world where it's grown up rules that we are brought up with. We need to rebel, don't we? Well, maybe not, but there is a great emphasis in this whole period on rebellion, rebellion, on revolution, as we've seen. Okay, right. An image you might have seen before. The artist Goya, the sleep of reason produces monsters. We can see his man asleep, and here are the monsters. The owl of Minerva, the owl of wisdom. But then he's rather ghoulish looking bats in the background. Now, why why show an image like that? Well, largely because it points to a kind of um, a contempt, a distrust for how some post war French philosophers are grouped, especially in English speaking culture and society as being postmodern. And these postmodernists they don't care about reason and truth. They just think it's all words. It's just wordplay. It's language games. Good, evil, truth, untruth, fact, fiction. It's your perspective, mate. It's all relative. This is a prevailing image of some of the thinkers that we're going to look at. We need to just quickly identify this. So let's just think briefly about what the purpose of philosophy is. Okay, I mean, we could probably talk about this for weeks and weeks, couldn't we? <laughs> um, so I just want to use this instead to kind of think about how our thinkers are differing. Um, and, you know, keep your ears tuned here because one of the three H's is briefly going to appear. Now, the guy on the left is Immanuel Kant, the major thinker of the Enlightenment. Now, Kant believes that human beings can acquire a remarkable degree of knowledge about themselves and nature. There is no need for scepticism. There is no need to fear that ultimately all our knowledge is a kind of guess based on probability, as David Hume had said before. No, instead, there is, we th our thinking takes place through certain universal categories. We, every time we think about anything, or at least anything in our worlds that we can sense, it must involve time and space. What Kant does is he, he identifies and develops more of these universal forms, categories of thinking, which point to the possibility of there being a kind of universal knowledge. But Kant at the same time is Lutheran, he's, a, he's, a, he's Christian, and a famous phrase of his is that he had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. But what Kant was really keen to do, as much as, as he wanted to argue the conditions of knowledge, he also wanted to make the case that the soul was immortal and that human beings have free will. Now that's tricky because if you're a leading philosopher in the late 18th century, what evidence are you going to use for this? And Kant is kind of put into this tricky position where he says, well, he can't rely on the sensible world, the, pheno the world of phenomena to demonstrate this. He's going to have to rely on on the world of noumena, of things in themselves, but things that cannot be seen. And this is where he makes his arguments about faith. 
and so on. Now, when we think about what the purpose of philosophy is in a statement like this, yes, it is about gaining knowledge, but it's also about understanding and focusing on what he calls practical reason, on becoming more moral, morally grounded human beings who are ultimately Christian human beings. And that philosophy is ultimately going to kind of take us in a circular route um, back to um, conformity with the doctrines of the day. This. We might not be so sure of. Certainly people weren't in the years after Kant. Now Hegel, clue, <laughs> um, claims that the rational is the real. I mean, this is a really dense sentence, isn't it? The rational is the real. What does that mean? That you know, what we reasonably understand to be real is real. Well, it means something even, kind of even weirder than that. And it's that what takes place in our minds about the world is is all that there is. That the world exists because it, the world as we understand it exists through our mind's understanding of it. That when we you know, look out, you know, into the world, if we look out the window and we see a tree, that, that's never a pure experience of, of my body and a tree. There is a human mind in the middle that sees, the, the, the you know, that gathers all the sense data and understands it in a certain form. That this is a tree, that I am here looking at a tree. That the tree moves with the wind, that we are moving through time and space. At the centre of all of this is the thinking mind. And what Hegel emphasises that philosophy is a way of understanding the ultimate online basis of reality. It has that possibility of reaching the truth. Aristotle, a little different. His philosophy aims at human flourishing, eudaimonia. So I put happiness there, but actually contentment is probably enough for what word you could use. Human flourishing is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. Now virtue, uh, the Greek word is arete, which means skill. That there needs to be something about like cultivating an excellent mental state in order to be content. But again, here the goal of philosophy is this kind of using right reason to understand nature, and it involves this optimistic possibility of knowing nature and of knowing the self. Spinoza, he's also going to come up on this course. He says that our thinking in its highest form should lead us up to the intellectual love of God. That we can understand with God, we can commune with God in a certain way. This is God, not as the guy, old guy of a beard, who is a jealous and vengeful God in the Old Testament. But this is God really understood as the, um, as the entirety of nature, the entirety of all existing things and power in the universe. A very abstract God, what is sometimes called Einstein's God. Now all of these you know, visionaries and major thinkers in the traditional Western canon are all optimistic about hum what human beings can know. They all place great emphasis on the powers of the human mind to understand itself and the world. Now, where does it go with some of our thinkers and their reputations? At the top left, Jacques Derrida. Bottom left, slightly more recognisable, Michel Foucault. Two things that we're going to spend a lot of time on this course. Now I'm quoting these guys really out of context here, but I'm trying to make I'm trying to make an interesting point. So Derrida famously says there is nothing outside the text. That there is, you know, all there is is text, all there is is kind of works, literary works, philosophical works. They're all of equal value and equal standing, seemingly by this quote. And they don't contain any truth except for their own internal consistency. So really what Kant is talking about Hegel is just a load of bollocks. Um, they, um, they're just dealing with very, very elaborate games of words. It's just wordplay. You know, it's a very, it's kind of very sophisticated mumbo jumbo. There's nothing beyond just beyond this. Philosophy, like science, cannot connect us to a world that is outside and beyond what we can see and hear and perceive, which kind of therefore means that everything is kind of subjective. Now this could be quite worrying because then, what is our grounding when we're dealing with crimes against humanity? 
this is a big debate. How do we deal with politicians who lie all the time and claim that they're speaking the truth? Now, food coast is something more interesting, at least in terms of this debate. He says that you cannot think of truth without, you know, as something that is disconnected from power. That power and the powerful produce truth. So not just truth as in propaganda, but truth as in scientific and philosophical truths. That in all claims of knowledge uh, that are influential are powerful forces behind them. Foucault says, let us say that we are obliged to produce the truth by the power that demands truth and needs it in order to function. We are forced to tell the truth. We are constrained. We are condemned to admit the truth or to discover it. Now, this on one level could be quite a sophisticated, sophisticated way of thinking about where philosophy can, well, that philosophy should reflect on the, on the elites that are able to write philosophy or teach it. But then does that, it comes, then does that, what do we do then? The problem here is that there is, a, it might potentially encourage a kind of cynicism where we just think that anybody saying anything is just trying to push their own agenda. And certainly this has been a kind of a fear when people are dealing with the emergence of right wing populism in their own time with Donald Trump. In a way that Trump kind of just, <laughs> just rewrites history, rewrites facts all the time. Global warming was made by the Chinese. I mean, this is an old one. Like, you know, really, I should just dig you out some from the last couple of weeks of coronavirus. But it's interesting that when people are trying to explain Trump and the way that he just rewrites history and tells lies all the time, that they put this down to postmodernism. And postmodernism is largely thought to be, oh, basically, um, a catch all term for 1960s radical French philosophy. There's been a big backlash against postmodernism. Of course, you might think, what the fuck does it even mean? Maybe we should explain this to you. Anyway, just some quotes. The most loathed concept from academia. Machiko Katukani says that it's academics promoting the gospel of postmodernism, promoting well, whatever that is, promoting postmodern ideas like Derrida or Foucault, supposedly. They've created Trump, okay? No, it's not a very unexpected thing to pin on Foucault. Um, worse still, <laughs> that these arguments have been used to terrorise students into submission to their lecturers' dogmas. Okay, so watch out. Daniel Denner, an important contemporary American philosopher, what the postmodernists have done, what they did is truly evil. Now, why would it be evil? I guess a big part of it points to this idea that what if, and this is a phrase from one of, um, oh, I think it's Rudy Giuliani, Trump's lawyer. Um, what if uh, the truth isn't true? What if there are alternative facts? You can see this at play in this cartoon. One man stands on another's neck. The man who is being strangled, I guess, he says, ouch, you're standing on my neck. Now, the powerful guy, you can tell that by the suit he's wearing, says, well, that's one point of view. But one could also say that you're trying to trip me with your neck. You see, in the postmodern condition, we create our own reality based on, upon our internalised preconceptions. Since there is no longer one objective truth, we are free to create our own truth. So you see, there is no right and wrong, just an infinite number of equally valid stories. But you're still standing on my neck. You never went to college, did you? Now, how does that bear on these guys? Well, on one level, it doesn't. It's kind of like, it's like a it's a, a posthumous birth, I guess. It's a weird kind of, you know, mutant reincarnation um, off certain post-structuralist, certain, um, uh, certain ideas of in the f brewing in 1960s France, which are very sceptical about our source of knowledge, which are then kind of, applied in contexts like this to mean that any morality is justified that everything is permitted now we'll need to ask is that true and does that apply is that a fair way of reading Foucault and Derrida basically we're going to sort of the answer probably is going to be no um but we're going to see some dangerous 
dangerous possibilities in the very obscure prose of Jacques Derrida. It's deliberately obscure, but still, and this is one thing that our course is really going to set out and do to try and demystify and clarify the obscure. This is another one. It's a great website called Existential Comics. It's quite funny. And here are the postmodernists. Okay, there's the guy in blue is Derrida, the guy in the middle is Foucault, and the guy on the right is Jacques Leotard. We'll, we'll meet him in a few weeks' time. And they're brainwashing our students. So we're kind of seeing actually, thinking about where we've cut what we've covered so far, two very different things with French for we've been dealing with this kind of flourishing of, of, of activity and unrest in May 68. We've been talking about fascism and communism and the Second World War and colonialism. And now we're talking about something different, which is that the efforts of some of these thinkers to critique and to undermine these old ideas of progress, these old structures, may be the, the dangerous consequence, at least as so far as some people read it, is that nothing is true anymore. How do we live? They don't believe in reason. They can't stand rational debate. Again, this is a, it's a very popular and lasting perception. So we need to understand that. Let's. Okay, right. So now I'm just going to give you an overview to the course. Um, and yeah, and then after that, I'm going to give you a bit more for grounding in some of the ideas that were taking place at this time. Okay, so. Our course takes place over 11 weeks and we are going to be doing a journey looking at large that one thinker per week so next week we're going to begin not in france actually <laughs> well it kind of it does begin in france it begins with walter benjamin um who is in exile in paris who dies at the french spanish border um trying to flee the nazis but we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to look at um, critical theory and the emergence of the Frankfurt School and a tradition that is sometimes called Freudo Marxism, the fusion of Freud and Marx. We're going to look at uh, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, but the reading is going to be something different. It's Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. I'll explain this more later. So we're going to start off looking at critical theory, the Frankfurt School. We're then going to think about colonialism and we're going to look at ideas of race and, and racism in the work of the psychiatrist and philosopher Franz Fanon on blackness and to a lesser degree on whiteness and what that means. We're going to look at Michel Foucault, really important to this course. We're going to um, look at a couple of things by him. We're going to look at um, what is translated in English as madness and civilization, but we're also going to look at an interview called Power and Knowledge. We're going to use Foucault to talk also about structuralism, about this new philosophical current which you know sweeps through France in the 1950s. Foucault is influenced by structuralism in lots of ways, but then he tries to go beyond it in others. I'm also going to meet another guy, Jacques Lacan, very interesting psychoanalyst, and his ideas about desire. So this is what we're going to do early on. These are our first five weeks. Um, okay, and then. We move on. We're going to look at the revival of Spinoza in 1960s France. Spinoza as a as a kind of figurehead, as a kind of prince, as a, a kind of a key word for a new way of thinking about power. This is we can associate this with Louis Althusser, who's very influential in his time. Isn't somebody people really look at that much nowadays. Um, he was going to write a very big book on Spinoza, but then somebody else writes a book on Spinoza and he says, well, they've already written what I was going to say, so he gives up. But he has a range, he, he um, runs a seminar on Spinoza. So we're going to look at Spinoza, but we're not just really at Spinoza directly. We're going to look at French Spinozism, Red Spinoza, I'm calling it, in particular through the work of this guy, Gilles Deleuze. Now from Deleuze, we're going to look at Jacques Derrida. Yeah, again, these, <laughs> these guys, uh, there's some like, wonderful kind of Derrida, in particular, the way that he kind of um, stage manages uh, his own image in photos is very curious. But with Derrida, we're going to look at the idea of difference. 
we're going to look at some of the most obscure and dense and terrible we could say of Derrida's writings but we're going to try and get to the basis and understand with respect and clarity what exactly he was trying to do with his thinking so this stuff um and then from there we're kind of moving into late 60s and 70s uh so we're going to have a week on May 1968 and the people, the three people at the top, um, Guy Debord, uh, Raoul Vanaheim, um, oh God, I can't remember what the other, what the other person's name is, um, Asker Yorn, I'm probably completely wrong on this. Um, we're going to look at the Situationist International, we're going to look at the ideas of the Situationist, they in their own way influenced punk music in Britain, Malcolm McLaren much later. Uh, we're going to ask why were people on strike? Why are they writing in May 68? But just as May 68 was a flashpoint of activity, we need to also deal with the problem of June 1968. Because Charles de Gaulle, he nearly, his government nearly collapses, but in the end, it's re-elected with a landslide. Everyone goes back to work. And there is this interesting question in French thought, why did we get so close to revolution and why did so many people back away? And this question is comes up in the guys on the left, Felix Guattari on the left, and then Deleuze to the right of him. Their work, Anti Oedipus, part of a, a two volume set of books called Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Why is it that people desire capitalism? Why do they desire authority? We're then going to look at um, what is sometimes called equature feminine, it's like female writing, women's writing, in the work of Lucia Rigore, also a psychoanalyst who trains under Jacques Lacan, and Helene Sizou. And we're going to use these two to kind of think about um, feminism and women's liberation from the late 1960s into the 70s. And then the final part, this is really like the final week, we're going to look at where French thought is um, from the 1970s into the 1980s. Politically, we see Margaret Thatcher, Francois Mitterrand to the left. Mitterrand being elected also on a landslide to form a new socialist government in France in the late 70s into the 80s. But then the kind of the collapse that happens after beginning of a radical agenda, much of it is given up upon. And what we can think of when we look back over the last 40 years is the rise of what is sometimes called neoliberalism, free market ideology, in which trade unions and workers movements, and I guess to a larger extent, public institutions like government and local government, all of their authority weakens and collapses. We're going to look at this through Jean Baudrillard, Baudrillard and the idea of postmodernism in the postmodern society. We're going to try and understand what postmodernism actually means, and then we're going to look at it in terms of what, how these thinkers were responding, responding to a society that was changing yet again, becoming even more individualistic in a different way. The rise of new forms of work, new forms of leisure, the rise of the personal computer, <laughs> like you see here. Okay, um, so this is our overview. This is what we're going to do. Okay, right, so <clears throat> what I'd like us to do is a discussion point when we meet on Monday and talk on Monday evenings is first of all, these questions. What are your preconceptions about post war French philosophy so far? And then, you know, what would you like to get out of this course? Hopefully this is going to be straightforward enough. Um, okay, let me just give you a couple of recommended reads, and then after that we are going to have a bit of a pause. So this book I really like, um, Modern French Philosophy, but there's lots of good stuff out there. Um, I'm going to basically provide you with everything that you need to read electronically. There's going to be a course website, I'll tell you about that in a second. I recommend this book. Um, there are some other good ones, I'm just pointing them on the screen in front of you. Um, Guttings, Thinking the Impossible, Wix, Modern French Philosophy, there's another great book by Alan Schrift. I'll put some links up um, on the course website. And then we're going to use this, basically, Moodle. Uh, it's a virtual learning environment. Basically, it's just a website. This is the address. You type it in, and then you'll log in, and then there'll be all the weeks of the course. The videos, the lectures will be up there. Um, and then um, I'll put lots of recommended things like podcasts, like amusing little articles, things to like help make sense of some of the dense material, further reads if you want to read more into a certain thing. It'll all be there basically. 
So you'll need to log into this Moodle page. You know, it's not open to the public. And so you'll have a username and a password. And if you're thinking, right, what are they? Well, they all follow the same format, basically. So your username is going to be your first name and your last name, or one word. And then your password is your first name and then the first letter of your surname in capital letters. If this also is that a lot of info. Um, let, this is, let's give you an example. Jacques Derrida. Let's say he wants to get onto Moodle and he wants to uh, read about um, the personal computer. Well, his username is Jacques Derrida. It's just his name. It's all lowercase and it's all one word. And the password is Jacques D, all capital letters. Okay, right, so I'm gonna, this first part I'm gonna draw to a close um, very shortly. I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna end with like an amusing little anecdote um, that during this time, the CIA began, began to become very interested in French philosophy of the 60s. And, um, you know, spooks were, you know, assigned to try and make sense of Derrida and Deleuze, and they really, really struggled. And there were these really you know, curious, interesting, like declassified reports of them trying to make sense of, this, of people like Derrida. Um, and how, you know, and their attempt to work out, you know, who could this stuff be more dangerous to? And what's interesting is that the CIA spooks say, well, you know, it's not a threat to us. This could be a threat to the Soviet Union. Although American policies are never immune to criticism in France, it's clearly the Soviet Union, which is now on the defensive. Led by a group of young renegades from communist ranks. Now, what they refer to here are the new philosophers. We'll talk about these guys much later in the course. This new left activism is likely to increase bickering between the two leftist parties and within the Socialist Party, and it will likely increase voter defection from both socialist and communist camps. Basically, it's going <laughs> to create a kind of apathy and wider dissent. Now, maybe that's a fitting point just to end this first part. The difficulty, uh, or the apparent difficulty of understanding post-war French philosophy in the United States and the UK. The images of these thinkers as being obscure and difficult. Now, this is exactly not what we're going to be doing on this course. We're going to try and explain, we're going to try and demystify, and we're going to try and group their concerns about an underlying desire to change the social fabric, to not repeat the, um, to not repeat Nazism, to not repeat fascism in any form again. The belief that enough world was possible, but it'd be one in which the free-thinking individual was going to be at the centre. Okay, so part two. Right, we still haven't said who the three H's are, although I know you all know who one of them is because it's a guy who's mentioned a bit earlier, Hegel. But who are the others? Well, you might think Hitler or Houdini, but instead these are some of the, the greats, some of the best off of Western philosophy, kind of. And one of them in particular is very controversial. The three H's in no particular order. Martin Heidegger on the left, looking rather grumpy. In the middle, Edmund Husserl, and on the right, George William Friedrich Hegel. Okay, um, in this part, I am just going to give you a bit more for grounding and who the three H's are. Basically, the point I'm going to make is that these three figures became very influential after the Second World War. In French philosophy so we kind of need to know why they're influential and then that way that will give us a good basis for understanding what Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, Lacan, all these people are trying to do but we just need to get this stuff just in mind. So one of the things that came up just earlier is the response to crisis, the response to a loss of meaning and the need to fashion a new meaning. Now this is a you know, this is quite disquieting photo from the first awards of a French soldier, this is the French charging over no man's land. And I'm using an image from the first world war because we need to kind of like think again about how war and mass participation in war and losing so many people in war or in any kind of social crisis, how that in a certain way it disintegrates the social fabric. Meanings are lost and new meanings need to be found. How do we deal with fear or despair? 
How do we deal with loss? All of this is, is in the brew. So of course, society language difference and the three H's are of real influence, I guess from 1930, from the 30s. So if they're becoming influential, what is in decline? You know, let's keep this in mind. Well, Kant, Immanuel Kant, and this kind of broader enlightenment philosophy have been very influential in France before then. And Kant, again, we talked about him earlier, and um, we can associate him with, you know, an idea of, of universal knowledge, of enlightenment. Kant has also got a strong moral component. You might have heard of the categorical imperative, you know, that morality needs to be universal and unflinching. Therefore, you know, do not lie in any circumstance, blah, blah, blah. This is often debated. So Kant had been of influence, but then he isn't. Bergson, enough of a figure who been influential, now in decline. Existentialism, this is something that we're going to talk about. Um, but, and this, this might apply to you if you've ever tried to read Hegel, it's very hard to read, very hard. Um, and one thing that we might want to keep in mind here is that sometimes our figures maybe uh, they'll set in this feeling and we get this even when people are writing about late that they're often name dropped and that people didn't really understand them. Part of the difficulty is because key works by these thinkers um, are they're not in French. Hegel, Heidegger, they're writing in German and their works aren't translated for a long time. Hegel's kind of major early work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, is only translated in 1947, but people have been using Hegelian ideas, you know, since the 30s. Maybe that's because they had access to German, but maybe not. Being in time by Heidegger in 1978. So Descombes, um, the author of Modern French Philosophy, this book that I recommend to you, um, he has this nice phrase. He said that basically people were influenced by almost the rumour or, it's, you know, by their own myth of what these thinkers really thought. We get this line in Maurice Merleau-Ponty, too, an important figure um, for a tradition of structuralism, kind of 1950s French philosophy that sought to identify universal structures in language and society. He has this great, there's a great, great line here. He's talking about why people love Hegel or Husserl or Heidegger. He says, we've all been waiting for them, basically. We've been waiting for them because they we're going to use these people to articulate the kinds of things that we've been concerned about. We are going to use, therefore, Husserl or Heidegger to speak French philosophy, to speak French concerns, 1930s or 1940s concerns. Merleau-Ponty, writing in the Phenomenology of Perception, says, It is less a matter of counting up quotations than of determining and expressing in concrete form this phenomenology for ourselves. This phenomenology is something that he's going to champion. Um, which has given a number of present day readers the impression on reading Husserl or Heidegger, not so much of encountering a new philosophy as of recognizing what they've been waiting for. Now, there could be a risk with that. If you're looking for what you're waiting for, then maybe you're not going to read the text in itself, as it were. Think about the problems of when the stuff was translated. Another thing from existential comics. Did anybody read it? So in this scene, it's somebody um, who wants to... Um, he wants to return a book. It's Hegel's Phenology of Spirit, which is really hard to read, but very interesting and rewarding. Um, well, you can see here, the bookseller has been selling a book, <laughs> this book with no words in it, because nobody's interested in, in really reading it. It's more about just showing off that you look clever. But actually some people, not many, maybe wanted to understand the internal context. OK, if this is already putting you off reading Hegel, let's let's say a bit about Hegel. H1, Hegel. Now, now think about that Merleau-Ponty line from earlier. What we're going to be dealing with in this short overview is not so much Hegel directly, but Hegel indirectly. We're going to talk about French Hegel, just as we're going to talk about French Heidegger or French Husserl. Now, the key figure for us is a guy called Alexander Kojev. And Alexander Kojev is a Russian emigre who is living and working in France, in Paris, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And he teaches a seminar, like an advanced level class, on Hegel's philosophy for about five, six years. And basically all of the French, many of the French leading intellectuals at the time attend this seminar. And this seminar 
is what you know why be thought to be part of why hegel becomes so influential in france from the 40s onwards kojev says i mean kojev is brilliant we're gonna i'm gonna ask you to read a little bit of kojev and we'll discuss this on monday he often comes out very bombastic statements so kojev, kojev says it may well be that the future of the world <laughs> and thus the sense of the presence present and the significance of the past oops um will depend in the last analysis of hegel's works we need to understand hegel and therefore we can understand all history and all the future it's going to unlock everything now hegel oh hegel uh, hegel is writing in the 18th century and uh, into the 19th century early 19th century but kojev is dealing with the early 20th and he saw great possibilities in something like the russian revolution and in the possibilities of um of marxism as achieving what hegel imagined as the end of history now why would that be attractive this kind of idea of a, of a, of a laws of laws of history that history is tending in a certain towards certain direction that you need to understand hegel's works to understand this why would this be compelling in a country that had been so broken by war in the first world war now this isn't an easy question I'm, i can't just give you a one sentence answer to it it reminds me of the poetry of wb yeats the second coming i mean he's writing about ireland but there's some interesting things there. Some of the lines will be familiar to you. These lines in particular, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. In the sheer colossal number of deaths of the First World War, there is this sense that meaning is lost. That violence has um, expunged everything sacred and valuable. But maybe out of that too, especially among veterans, or people that lost after the wars, this idea that maybe out of violence, some of the violence that is necessary for history to change and develop, that violence has to mean something. We should, in some ways, we shouldn't wish violence, but we should recognise that humanity is violent. The first war was this kind of wake up call in this way. Now, Hegel was attractive precisely because he was offering laws of history in which human beings could become masters of their destiny after, after all of this misery, after this world in which the best lack all conviction. We're not going to talk about these figures, but they're, you know, they're just interesting in themselves. Georges Bataille, Maurice Blanchot, André Breton, <laughs> it's a great picture of him. You might know him from the Surrealist, the Surrealist Manifesto. These are all people that were attending these seminars by Kojev. Um, and what Kojev really introduces is this, well, I guess we call it one law of history that we call the dialectic. Now, the dialectic is, is kind of hard to understand. Um, these are just some context here. I've kind of gone through this, actually. Um, the idea of the, the dialectic, well, is this idea that Remember, Hegel believes that human thinking is at the centre of all history. It's a way that kind of ideas and culture exist on a universal level and that human beings are progressively becoming, are gaining um, a surer and stronger grip on knowledge, through knowledge, which is, God, I'm being really woolly here, aren't I? Um, let me start again. What? What Hegel imagines by this law of the dialectic is that human thought and human history is tending towards a direction of progress. But this direction is not linear. We're not going to just get there without resistance. There is resistance and reaction at every point. Just as there is reformation, there is counter-reformation. Just as there is revolution, there is counter-revolution. But that doesn't stop things in their tracks. There may be a dark ages after the Roman Empire, but ultimately human beings are becoming more capable, are becoming more culturally and technologically sophisticated. Ultimately, human life is improving in some form, especially in the mind and in the mind's grasp of things as they are using its reason. That is the dialectic. That decided that we are progressing in a certain direction. And one thing underpins it, this, this law of history that I mentioned, this movement. Now, Sartre is writing in 1960. He, well, his work is completely transformed by this attempt to understand Hegel and this law of history. 
that the dialectic can't be understood by a concept. It's a bit of an anti-intellectual argument in some ways. Um, because its movement engenders and dissolves all concepts. It is the fl it is the flow in which concepts begin and end. Now, you might have come across Hegel before. It's sometimes this phrase used thesis, antithesis, synthesis. These aren't words that Hegel ever used, but it's just a nice way of trying to summarise it because it is really dense. Hegel talks about the dialectic being like a... Um, like a spiral in the shell there. Now, when we think about these laws of history, reformation, counter-reformation, revolution, counter-revolution, it's this idea that things appear, but then there is a struggle and there is opposition, but then ultimately out of this opposition becomes a synthesis or a combination of the, of the, of the new idea and the reaction, and as a result, ideas develop and progress through this. They're not like, if it were linear, we would just be kind of going up. But instead, we have a spiral where we're going round and round. And it takes a long time for consciousness, for knowledge to develop in some form that can be socially agreed upon. Now, this idea of dialectic was very exciting for many people. Um, let's go back to Merleau-Ponty again. Merleau-Ponty, as far as he's concerned, Hegel is the beginning of all philosophy. All the great philosophical ideas of the past century, the philosophies of Marx and Nietzsche, phenomenology, German existentialism and psychoanalysis, had their beginnings in Hegel. Why? It was he who started to attempt to explore the irrational and integrate it into an expanded reason which remains the task of our century. Again, there's this sense of epochal destiny that is going to be lost by the 70s, definitely. If we do not despair of a truth above and beyond divergent points of view, if we remain dedicated to a new classicism, an organic civilization, these are powerful terms, while maintaining the sharpest sense of subjectivity. Again, there's going to be a big reaction to some of these claims later. Deleuze, Derrida. Then no task in the cultural order is more urgent than re-establishing the connection between, on the one hand, the thankless doctrines which try to forget their Hegelian origin, and on the other, that origin itself. So everything is about recognising and understanding the influence of Hegel and how it pervades everything. Now that's interesting because what we're seeing here is this 30s, 40s, 50s philosophical direction where Hegel is right at the centre. And then that changes. A bit of a blurry picture, but you've got Deleuze and Foucault. And both of these figures say that they reject Hegel. They reject Hegelism. Schill's Deleuze in a work called Difference and Repetition, 1968, um, he says that his work is part of a move towards a generalised anti-Hegelianism. So rather than this kind of dialectical move towards identifying with the truth, an identification with knowledge where there isn't any contradiction, Deleuze says, no, we need, we need and must celebrate difference. The identical stifles difference, and this is dangerous. Foucault. Our entire epoch struggles to disengage itself from Hegel. That we kind of need to do our thinking through different thinkers, through Marx and Nietzsche. So there's a, there's a battle here. And what's the, I guess we want to just keep in mind, what is the problem with Hegel? Again, there's this going to be this emphasis, and this has a bearing on the protest movements and the social movements, women's liberation, gay liberation, and so on, of the 1960s that are about championing and celebrating minority rights and difference. And what Hegel's kind of operation seems to do is try and suck everything into a universal, uniform sameness. This seems dangerous. This silences minorities. This stifles dissent. This could be a problem. It might, on for earlier thinkers, it might point to the possibility of a universal truth. But that becomes increasingly abandoned by the 1960s. We're going to celebrate otherness. We're going to respect the rights of the other. We're not going to make the other identical to us. So this is what is happening, basically. Um, now, Kojev, doing his seminars in Paris, the way that he's reading Hegel is kind of strange in other ways. And one of the things that Kojev really highlights is that conflict is at the centre of human experience and human life. In, the, in this image before you, you can see two guys with pistols, you can imagine some aristocrats going for a duel out on a field somewhere. Enough way of thinking about it is boxing. 
what we're dealing with is what is sometimes called the uh, master-slave relation or the lord-bondsman relation. What Kozhev does, he translates uh, what Hegel calls lord-bondsman into master and slave. And what this basically means is, what Hegel has to kind of propose is that at an early stage of human consciousness, this isn't like historical, this is more kind of in the underlying structures of thinking, there is a conflict there is a struggle in which two beings wish to recognize and be recognized by another being. They almost they chance upon each other. We can imagine like, you know, being on a narrow power path. That's the, you know, we'll go for a country walk. The path is very narrow and, you know, you can't get past each other and you recognize each other. And what do you do next? Maybe enough ways if you ever try to drive in London. <laughs> Such a, maybe this isn't a bad analogy. And you're trying to get past another car. Um, where the street is just full of parked cars, you know, what do you do? Well, um, there only one person can win. So, okay, let's use parking. Actually, this is actually a much better analogy than I originally thought. This is straight off the hoof. Well, one person's got to back down. One person is going to have to reverse down the road so that the other car can get past. Normally, this depends on who, whose car is bigger. You know, the, the, the lorry, the, the van delivering Amazon parcels, you know, it's normally going to get past the little mini. One person... One person wins and another loses because they can't just crash into each other. This will be a fight to the death in which both die. But one of them decides that they don't want to die, that they don't want to fight to the death. They want to live. They choose life. But then that means backing down and therefore being weaker. And being weaker is to be the slave. By not wishing to be killed, one therefore accepts that the master rules one and therefore you are the property of the master. I mean, it does sound quite strange. It sounds quite metaphorical, doesn't it? the master-slave relation. And what I'll say is just Google it, just look it up later and try and read more. But what it points to is the fact that conflict, this early form of conflict, is key to the formation of who and what we are. That history, you know, from you know hunter-gatherer tribes up until modern civilizations, is about conflict. It's about people fighting for scarce resources. But sometimes they're not fighting just for food, they're fighting for something that doesn't make any material sense. Fighting for recognition, fighting for just simply for, for self-affirmation. Now there's something a little bit denser here, I'm just, some of the stuff I've just talked through. And it's about our own sense of selfhood. Do you remember I used that phrase earlier about we're not like just beings, our minds aren't just like black boxes. We shouldn't just think of our own identity in terms of ourself, you know, which kind of speaks inside our own heads, inside our own skulls. It isn't just about us, because everything that's a part of our sense of self isn't just us talking to ourselves. It's the way that we understand and have internalised an outside world. So thinking back to that master-slave relation, um, we've internalised our own sense of power and weakness with other beings. And we have in, part of our own sense of self is involves this sense of how we relate and how we could and how we should relate, relate to other people so in the dense philosophical jargon this is to exist not just for me not just for myself but also for the other for the other person and what that therefore means okay so this is something that i'd like us to talk about on monday as well actually um i'm gonna just send you a word document it's quite short just a paragraph really um, so what view of Hegel does Kozhev present in this passage and what might the implications be in 1930s Europe? And part of why this is what comes up actually. Kozhev asks, what is the morality of Hegel? What, well, and then he says, what exists is good in as much as it exists. All action being a negation of the existing given is therefore bad or sinful. But sin may be forgiven. How? By its success. Huh? Success absolves the crime because success is a new reality that exists. But how can success be estimated? Before this can be done, history must have come to an end. There's a couple of really quite baffling things there, isn't there? This idea that everything is just action. There is, you know, That morality is about what exists, it kind of seems a bit amoral in a certain way, and that history can come to an end. And that history will come, you know, that when this idea that history can come to, to an end, and this is something that 
Kochev talks about this section too, that which put on the screen. But there will be a moment in the future where there'll be no more war, so there'll be no more revolutions. Kochev also says that philosophy will disappear once we get to the end of history. Like man, the, at the top, the definitive annihilation of man. That there is something about our thinking and something about human history that at some point will end. Now you might think of Francis Fukuyama in the end of history. What he does is he takes Hegel and Kochev and he applies it to, to in the year 1990. But Kochev is talking about the 30s and 40s. And his belief is that a kind of form of technologically sophisticated, you know, Soviet um, style socialism of a more international and, and Western European character is going to mark the end of history. And once we've got to an end of history and an end of conflict, there'll be no need for philosophy, there'll be no need to think. We will no longer change, we'll just be the same. And anything that we do, like art, or what, will just be for our own pleasurable amusement. Now this was striking at the time. It was kind of shocking, the idea that history would end and what that would mean. And you can imagine here how intoxicating it is for someone to suggest that there are laws of history and that we can have control, we can be masters of history. That almost plays on these enlightenment dreams that you know reason can conquer everything but we've now just redefined it in terms of conflict okay so this is kind of what Kojev is trying to do um and here is just a bit more about Kojev um but i'm not going to touch on those i guess just a, a couple of final things just about this um these are more kind of quotes so these slides will be up on moodle in case you want to watch them again or look at them again um it's a sense of where do we go so kojev was thinking a lot about the soviet union thinking a lot about marxism one thing about kojev is he ends up becoming one of the architects of the european union later in the 50s and 60s so our h1 is hegel and h1 is this idea that history can come to an end and that we can have control of history and nature but it's not a struggle of the right, the best, you know, it's not a struggle of the good guys. It's just simply a, stream, a human struggle for recognition. So this is H1. Let's look at H2, Heidegger. So to understand H2, we need to look at another key figure of existentialism in France, and that is Jean-Paul Sartre. Now, in 1955, he gives a lecture to Paris, which has just been liberated. You know, remember those soldiers going into Paris, the white soldiers. And he presents what he calls existentialism. He's not the first to use that term, but he is one of the first to give it the outline of which we now know. One of his key phrases is that existence precedes essence. That existence is something that defines, and we have the power to define what, what counts and what matters for us. At the center of existentialism is human subjectivity, what it means to be a human self, a thinking self. And what Sartre does, and this is quite strange, um, is he puts, he, his aim is to take God away from the centre of history and put man, man with a capital M at the centre, the human mind. We can decide who we are to be. Let's just look at a couple of these arguments. And I'm going to, this is also going to be on the passage that I'm asking about. Atheistic humanism, this is what he calls it. What he says he's going to present is an atheism of human history. That is one in which God, God and divine rules, biblical rules, universal morality has been toppled. As far as Sartre is concerned, there's no such thing as God. All God is, is a projection of human attributes, human qualities onto something that's mythical and divine. It, we alienate what is the best within ourselves and human nature and culture and we project it onto something which is outside us and which is in, a, in its own way hostile to us, but also loving to us. Now, what Sartre wants to do is get take God out of the picture and put the power of the human mind and the power of human subjectivity in its place. That whereas once upon a time, God, you know, think about creation story in the first seven days, God created everything. Now man creates everything. What man really has the power to create it's not, you know, things that exist in nature. You know, we can't make trees exist with the power of our minds, but we can change the way we think about nature. We can change the way we think about the world. That's within our power. And so this emphasis on what we think about our subjectivity is really important. This comes up elsewhere, and this is something I'm going to ask you to look at. 
this is you know this second sentence is key for what Sartre is trying to trying to do. This is that man is the being whose appearance brings the world into existence. He sees his philosophy in 1945 as a solution to the chaos, to the mud of enlightenment, to the death camps. So there are no more gods, just human being as a god. Maybe this will stop these kind of these miserable experiences of human history from being repeated. So this is the third discussion point. What does Sartre call the first principle of existentialism? Well, it's all quite intoxicating stuff, isn't it? We simply are. There is no human nature. We have the power to make ourselves. Therefore, human nature can change in every point in time. Now, what Sartre was trying to do in 1945, he was, he said, he was, during the Second World War, he is, um, like many French soldiers, he's captured quite early on, and he's in a prisoner of war camp, and then he manages to escape it. Um, and he's like, he's kind of hiding in Paris, basically. And he's reading a lot of German philosophy. He's very interested in Heidegger. Heidegger's work hasn't been translated into French, and he's trying to understand what Heidegger is trying to say. And this existentialism as a humanism is a lecture that's trying to apply what he sees as Heidegger into French thought. And of course, Heidegger's still alive. He is a key figure in a way for Nazism. He was in Germany and he supported the Nazi regime. He was he became anti-Semitic. There's a lot of problems with, you know, with trying to understand Heidegger. I don't know if we can really rehabilitate him. That's another story. But Heidegger comes across this, what Sartre's trying to say, and he says, look, mate, you're wrong. You've misunderstood me. Again, there is in the first sentence we can see what what excites Sartre. Thinking accomplishes the relation of being to the essence of the human being. Okay, it's dense, but it's this, it's this immense power of human thinking to fashion the world. But Heidegger emphasizes language. Language is the, is the kind of the code of this thinking. Language is the house of being, and that's where we dwell. Now I've dropped this in because language is going to be important in our third H. So Heidegger sees thinking as being very active, it's something that we could fashion and do for ourselves. Thinking is a form of work. But what Heidegger does is he writes um, a response to Sartre where he, he disagrees with him because he doesn't think that Sartre goes far enough. As far as he's concerned, this is just simply the way that people, it's just what people already believe. But instead of talking about God, it's just man with capital M. You know, that's not like a new way of understanding the world as it appears to the human mind. You're just simply saying that, you know, down with God, let's replace humanity in its place. And what's going to change as a result of that? Now, keep in mind, this uh, letter on humanism 47 is the only real bit of Heidegger that um, people that can only read French can, will be able to get up until the late 70s. Anyway, one kind of response out of this, it's later called the humanist debate, is this the status of man or the status of the human? And so Sartre is trying to elevate humanity, the human being, and what we get is this backlash. People are like, hold on a minute, what is it? What does man, who is man? Do you mean Western man? Is this man as in men, masculinity, something male? This is risky. So lots of people go in different directions. Deleuze will use Nietzsche and say that, hold on a minute, this last man, you know, he just sounds like um, a bourgeois liberal. The Marxists, you know, this is just reinforcing the current order. Claude levi Stroh, we're going to come in more in a moment. He says, hold on a minute, this is, this is bullshit. What do you mean man here? This is just an old-fashioned man. This is throwback. We need to get rid of man. Kojev, same thing. The end of history, my memory is the death of man. So all of this ends up becoming part of what is called theoretical anti-humanism. That doesn't mean that these thinkers are, they hate human beings or they're against human nature, but they're simply saying that thinking can't just be about trying to rescue and revive a singular and too reductive notion of what it means to be human. We need to just go beyond that. We need to go beyond a single normative prescriptive idea of how human beings are and how they should think and feel. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it is quite dense, isn't it? Um, now, H3, Husserl, not so well known in English speaker philosophy, but still important. There he is on the left, and there is Merleau Ponty, who we met just a moment ago. Now, just a little bit of background here on what is happening in French fort during this time. 
So one thing that you might know that in France, there's more regard to philosophy, I suppose, in, in children's education than there is in the UK. So people, kids at school learn philosophy in some form. But at the same time, up until 1965, if you were to do philosophy at university, you couldn't just do philosophy. There was a requirement that you actually had a, a, a training in one of the sciences. Um, and you needed to have this training and be certified um, in order to then teach philosophy. So as a result, all of the kind of major um, French philosophers of this period have a kind of expertise in other areas. So some of these are what we call like hard sciences, like physics, chemistry, biology. Others are like soft sciences, like social sciences, psychology, ethnology, and so on. You're not allowed to, like, sociology doesn't quite exist as a discipline in France at this period, it appears later. So actually a lot of key French sociologists are trained in philosophy. Philosophy is the way that you become a sociologist. That's kind of why in something like Pierre Bourdieu or others, um, a lot, all of their sociology is, is like inflected with philosophy. Anyway, so a lot of people studying philosophy end up having a lot of training in the sciences, and that has a bearing on what our thinkers are trying to do in the 50s and 60s. We've been talking about existentialism, Camus, Sartre, subjectivity. That's direction number one for thinking after the Second World War. But direction number two is the history of science, or the history of the concept. Um, and this is looking at how scientific ideas develop and are perpetuated. Now, some of you might have heard of Thomas Kern, Paradigm, Paradigm Shifts in France, Georges Conglem, Gaston Bachelard. These are very important figures who end up influencing Michel Foucault. And what Foucault tries to do in a lot of his work is think about how ideas and discourses of true ideas develop and the role of power in mediating these developments. How there can be these breaks, epistemic breaks, I think Bachelard calls them, breakthroughs, how knowledge changes, how you go from not having an account of gravity to gravity and so on. Now, another effect of this is that our philosophers with their training in the sciences start trying to apply scientific concepts and ways of thinking to philosophy, to culture, to society. And this has a very interesting effect, um, especially in anthropology. When you take universal structures, you know, laws of nature, you literally like get laws of gravity and you start applying them in different directions. And this is where an influence an influence in linguistics is going to come. So let me show you this. You might have seen this image before by Magritte. This is not a pipe. That's a curious one, isn't it? What do you mean it's not a pipe? Is it that the text isn't a pipe? Is it that the image of the pipe isn't a pipe? But it is a pipe, but it's not a real pipe. There's a question here about what the real thing is in relation to what signifies it, this, the signifier and the signified. Let me give you a more, more everyday example. Sign not in use on a road. Now this is brilliant. I mean, whoever's come up with this, you know, really knows their semiotics. Because yeah, the sign isn't in use because it says it's not in use, but actually it is in use because it's a sign. You know, the sign is telling us that it's not in use. The sign is telling us not to look at the, not to follow the sign. Oh, actually, that, that's you know, this is now getting a bit postmodern, isn't it? What is the true meaning of this sign? Now, what we're getting in this period, you get it with Roland Barr, um, is taking ways of understanding human language and trying to apply them more broadly, trying to apply them to popular culture. This is what he does in this book, Mythologies from 1957. It's quite amusing. Um, so these guys are part of traditional phenomenology. I think I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't want to define it back then because we were already doing so much work. Um, where we're basically getting thinkers in 1940s, 50s France who are already influenced by Hegel as well, like Merleau-Ponty, like levi strauss And they're asking, hold on a minute, when, the way that we think about language, why can't we apply it to society or the unconscious mind? Maybe there are, there are these universal structures in language and these would, well, if they do exist, we can demonstrate them and linguists have been able to demonstrate these general structures in language. There may be, there can be universal structures in how we think and how we imagine or in our myths. Now, this attention to structures is what leads to what we call structuralism, universal structures. And the important thing to, to just take from this is that it starts in philosophy, but it's philosophers taking from the harder sciences and then applying that material to culture, society and language, uh, culture and society. Two big sources, Husserl and Ferdinand Saussure. 
semiotics, the study of science. So Saussure is a Swiss guy, he's working in the early 20th century, he doesn't write, he does a lecture series on science, um, but he doesn't write this down, but then his students write down. And he produces this whole work looking at the relationship between the signifier and the signified, like the, you know, well, the, the signifier um, being the image of a pipe or the word pipe, and then the signifier being an actual pipe that you might hold in your hand and smoke from. And you might have noticed in his earlier pictures that if, if you're um, a 20th century French philosopher, then a pipe or a cigarette is a must-have accessory. Now, how does Husserl fit into this? He's a little bit later. For him, he he is he's all about this phenomenology. Phenomena is attention to what we directly experience, the phenomena of what we experience. And Husserl said that we should look at human consciousness and subjectivity as our main point of study. And we should focus, again, think of, there's also an influence here of Hegel, focus on, on the mind that mediates the experience that we have of the world. Remember I gave that example of the tree, looking out of the tree, it's my mind making sense of it. What Husserl wants us to do is understand how we think what we experience, how we sense and understand what we experience. And again, the point is that we cannot have pure unmediated access to what we experience there's always something in the middle there's always a veil there was a filter when we think about a tree it has to we are using certain concepts or ideas or images or memories or as Cameron said categories of thought like space and time therefore if there there are these underlying universal structures and if we can understand them we can we've got a key to understanding all four that's the dream that's the vision that's part of this kind of optimism that you get, especially in the 50s, early 60s French philosophy, that by reaching these underlying structures, we'll be able to explain everything else. Merleau-Ponty is key for this. It's a dense statement here, but what he's talking about is the presence of structure outside us in natural and social systems and within us as symbolic function. If we can understand this structure that is outside us in society, in cultural symbols, in religious symbols, and it's inside us in the way that we've internalized those symbols, then we can get beyond old philosophy. Then we can we can almost marry the internal and the external, the inner and the outer. Levi Strauss, this is a really bold, optimistic statement. He thinks that we if we can understand the structures of language, then this is going to transform knowledge in the same way that nuclear physics had has. Structural linguistics will certainly play the same renovating role with respect to the social sciences that nuclear physics, for example, has played for the physical sciences. Now, this is not going to happen whatsoever. But what's interesting is that there is this kind of bold optimism and hope in 50s, 60s France. Out of crisis comes an energized sense of possibility because these are world builders. Just as you had the Marshall Plan rebuilding Germany or, J or Japan or rebuilding Europe, so these philosophers are trying to rebuild four out of the ruins, out of the debris. And it can be done in all sorts of ways. What makes Bart's really interesting is that he talks about popular culture, the image of the child soldier. What does a new citron mean or a glass of red wine mean for the French? And using these kind of anthropological um, techniques and using these linguistic structures in a very kind of, you know, very like homely and very disorienting way. It's brilliant. It's quite funny. Okay, so rounding up um, with H3, with Husserl, with structuralism. I know this is a bit, it's all a lot to take in. Um, there is this confidence that we can understand our world through understanding the structures, the, imagine, the imaginary structures that can be observed, I guess. More to the point, if we can understand the, um, the structures of language, structural linguistics, then we're going to be able to explain the, the social and political order. We're going to be able to explain history. Remember, back with Hegel and Kozhev, there's enough a belief that we can explain the laws of history for this dialectical struggle. Okay, it's very interesting that we define history. This means that if we can use this knowledge, not just to understand science in themselves, but understand something that's a lot more powerful. And then the final part, it means that when it comes to culture, you know, a new, a new record, a new film, a new book, instead of thinking about them in the old way in terms of the author's motivation and, and intention or, you know, certain themes or, or, the, or the literary form, instead we can take anything, that album, that film, that novel, 
and we can find the underlying myths and symbols and, and linguistic structures and we can if we know the right questions we can suddenly get remarkable answers we can we can find a key to understanding our own culture so this is where we are these are the three h's and what happens and this is what we're going to look at over the remainder of this course is that they basically become supplanted by what Paul Ricoeur calls the masters of suspicion, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche. But that, folks, is enough a story. So let's just round up. Lots of upheaval, the three H's. We've just dived into a bit of Cogier, Sartre and Merleau-Ponty. And there's three discussion points that I'd like us to tackle on Monday, um, which are you know what you want to get from the course let's talk a bit about Kojev and Hegel and we're going to talk a bit about existentialism after this using Nietzsche using Marx using Freud we're going to be dealing with three figures who are very suspicious and very critical of how power shapes and distorts the way that we think about ourselves and society ideology the unconscious a master, um, a Judeo-Christian slave morality, things that we're not aware of but completely shape and distort our thinking. How do they distort our thinking? What if the structures are not as visible as the earlier thinkers suggested? What if there's a great danger in wanting to be swept up into a universal law of history? What about desire? What about difference? What about rebellion? These all count. Okay, so next time on Monday, we're going to talk at six. Um, probably last one to two hours. I'll email you a link quite soon. And then, okay, so right, the reading for the following Monday, for the, for the following week, is Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. So basically, next week, like class two, we're going to be looking at critical theory in the Frankfurt School. It's the only like major non French stuff we're going to do. I wanted to give you One Dimensional Man because it's really good. And gripping to read and one if there's one problem with the Frankfurt School their texts are quite dense and I don't want us to be kind of knocked back too early on but we're going to talk about Walter Benjamin and we're going to talk about Adorno and Horkheimer quite a bit so I'm gonna as a bit of background reading if you're trying to understand the Frankfurt School Grand Hotel of Is by Stuart Jeffries is really good and I'm going to put more stuff up on Moodle right okay there's not going to be a part three after this Um, this is just like a like a bumper first class session um here after they should all be a bit shorter oh okay right i think i've deserved this glass of water and uh, thanks so much everyone and i look forward to speaking to um, you on monday